What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Post Gazette Sports Now YouTube channel and podcast network. He is Andrew Dustin. I am Noah Hiles. As always, this show is brought to you by the North Shore Tavern. If you love baseball, you'll love the North Shore Tavern. The interior is wall to wall pirates. There are appetizers, entrees, cocktails, and of course, steak and seafood on a sizzling lava stone. Open every day. The North Shore Tavern is across from Pansy Park and is Pittsburgh's home for steak on a stone. Andrew, Pirates complete another series. They lose two of three to Tampa Bay. Uh, including Sunday's loss, which was another very, very winnable game that for one reason or another, they couldn't come through with. Holderman allows two runs in the eighth, uh, equaling his season total on the year prior to that outing. And aside from by Brian Reynolds, who went two for three with a walk, the rest of the Pirates lineup went one for 27 with three walks against the Rays pitching staff. That is... Well, I'll say it. I mean, it's subpar this season. So we've got a lot to get into throughout this entire series. I'll let you pick our first talking point. What do you What do you want to go after here to begin this? Yeah, for me, it's the offense. I feel like that's just got to be the conversation yeah. topic at this point. And I, I, you know, I'll extrapolate this not just to the series, but let's look at the homestand. Over a six-game homestand where you look at what they did, um, they ended up going three and three. Uh, they scored 14 runs over six games. It's a little bit over two runs per game. Um, I get it. They still went three and three. They went 500. That's not horrid. But like, this is a development that obviously it's a baseball season. It's a 162 game grind. There's going to be ebbs and flows. That is evidenced by what they did in May after those early season struggles that were very well documented. They're another one of those slides, though, and they really cannot afford one of those. Um, that's what really stands out to me is that, like you said, Noah, obviously it's just not a great raise uh, pitching group, rotation, and bullpen. The Reds, tip your cap where you can to guys like Nick Lodolo and Hunter Green, but that's not a sufficient excuse. The offense is struggling again, and it's really coming back to take away very winnable games. Yeah, I mean, you you, you bring up Lodolo and, and Hunter Green, and first off on that point, playoff teams, Andrew, occasionally have to beat good starting pitching. Correct. If you're going to actually be a serious contender, you can't just – lose close games or win one nothing when you face a Tyler Glass now or a Hunter Green. You can't just win both of those games were actually one nothing wins. Look at this brain. Uh yeah. but in all seriousness, I mean you can't just get shut down every time you face a good pitcher because guess what? There's a lot of good pitching this year in baseball. And if you're going to be playing meaningful baseball, you're going to run into these guys. And if you get into the playoffs, Something this whole town's talking about right now. Invest in the team, get more bats because this pitching is going to do so great in the playoffs. Well, look what good pitching does to this team. Look what good pitching does to this lineup. It's it's almost where you should question if you do invest because is one hitter going to make it that big of a difference? They're, they seem like they're multiple hitters away right now, Andrew. It's, it's bad. And you talk about them struggling against good pitching. You know who's not a good pitcher this season is Aaron Savali. Here's a note from Dan Zangrilli from The Fan. Since April 21st, Savali has had a 658 ERA, the worst in the major leagues among the 103 pitchers with at least 50 innings pitched. That was coming into Sunday. The Rays had lost eight games. The last eight games he pitched in, the Rays lost. But on today, he mustered just three hits and one run against. The Rays won the game 3-1. This guy beat a team with Paul Skeens on the mound, Andrew. It's yeah. Not enough for this lineup, and I, I don't know what you do here. I don't know what you do. I don't know what to fix or how to fix this because it's it just seems like each month there are two or three guys who hit the ball very well, and if those guys do not carry you to victory and you do not win one to nothing, you've got no hope. And on a Sunday where you need to sit guys down, Andrew McCutcheon needs an off day. Nick Gonzalez needs an off day. You've got no firepower, and today was a perfect example. Offense is a problem, aside from Brian Reynolds, who I will throw it to you to talk about. Yeah, Reynolds, that's uh, the lone bright spot, right? And, and kind of going with that trend, like you mentioned, of guys like Nick Gonzalez when he burst on the scene was hitting really well, or Connor Joe earlier in the season. Both those guys mired in uh, their struggles right now. I believe Connor Joe, it's something like five for his last 52, and Nick Gonzalez won for his last 14 or one for his last 17. I'm just going off the cuff there. But um, but Brian Reynolds, he's been the, very much the exception. Um, it's something that we've written about at the Post-Gazette, just about some slight changes he's made, reverting back to what works for him. The base is not nearly as wide 
which he had done earlier in the season kind of as a timing mechanism. Um, as anybody, any baseball fan knows, when you have the leg kick involved where you've kind of got that timing mechanism, sometimes things can get out of whack. Reynolds went away from it. He brought back that little slight leg kick that he does where he just picks up the front heel. And he's on time for everything right now, man. He's grooving fastballs. He's sitting on off-speed pitches. The home run today, we were recording this on Sunday. I mean, he was right on time for a breaking ball. It feels like he's seeing any and everything and hitting like the hitter that, you know, they expected him to be when they paid him that big contract last year, right? Yeah. I mean, this is this is the guy that you want Brian Reynolds to be, right? When, when your team's slumping, this is what you pay – a lot of money for the guy who's going to carry you to a win. And in, in some cases it's, it's quite literally been that you look to the series previous, the one, nothing home run win over the reds with green on the mound. And it, it was almost that again today, Andrew. I mean, you look, I mean, he, he out hit the entire team. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's like funny, but it's also not funny because I mean, as good as he's been, it's a waste. When there's nothing else around it. And uh, it's, I mean, Cruz has been decent and Telez has been decent this month, but you've got to find a way to get more. And it's it's good for Reynolds again, but it's almost like, sure, yes, you welcome good production, but how nice would it be if this production could be matched with just everyone else playing average baseball? And again, you're not getting it. So that will conclude our offense talk today, Andrew. I don't think there's any more to discuss. Um, what there is a lot to talk about as far as uh, the other side of the coin goes is pitching. Jared Jones, seven awesome innings. Well, I would say six awesome innings. And then there was the first on Saturday. And then Paul Skeens, one weird home run, one pitch in. And then the rest of it was really, really good from him. The two go 14 combined innings in this series, allowing three earned runs just more of the same we've seen from these duo or this duo, just your take on both uh, against Tampa. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's take away those first innings, like you mentioned, and otherwise it was simply spectacular. I'll, I'll kind of zoom in here on Jones and allow you to take over some more of the bulk on the skeins front. Um, but with Jones, I mean, what kind of stood out to me was just, he has mentioned at times to us and, and, you know, in those group settings, how, you know, kind of expanding the arsenal is going to be important for him and it will be eventually, um, but when he has both the fastball and slider working for him like he did against Tampa Bay, there's a reason he got off to such a hot start. There's a reason that he can be truly unhittable like he was and only giving up three hits to Tampa. The way he tunnels those two pitches, when they're on, when he has command of both, there's it, it's why he's so good. And that was yeah. the case against Tampa Bay. When he has that at his, uh, you know, at his will, it's as good as anybody in baseball, if not better, in terms of two pitches looking identical, one falling off the table, the other one being able to play up in the zone. That's what we saw from Jones. That's what really impressed, uh, stood up to me, especially given some of those struggles that he's had recently. Um, he responded from arguably his most challenging start as a big leaguer against the Rockies, where was there, there was the Yasmani Grandal fiasco of throwing the ball back to the pitcher, um, where he was obviously not happy after that game much more pleased after this start on Saturday. And that's certainly stood out to me and with Skeens, I know you'll probably build off this and then some, but um, just continuing to go deep into games, the deepest he's gone into a game. And obviously come on, pumping 102 past a guy at the very end says a lot about his physical makeup and really just his arsenal in general. Yeah. I mean, Skeens is just on another planet right now. I, I, I don't think you'd be wrong to argue that this might be the best pitcher in baseball that we're watching at the moment. I mean, you could, you could find other guys who have been doing it longer, but pound for pound right now. I mean, the guys are guaranteed six innings every time he's out there and it's three runs or it's two runs or less. It's more often one run or less uh, when he's going. I just want to make a quick note on Jones as well. Um, this dude is just a home pitcher. When you look at the numbers, three and two, two twenty ERA, and a 201 batting average against at PNC Park. Meanwhile, on the road, two and four, 559 ERA, 243 batting average against. And granted, I think a lot of that high total comes from really two games. There's the Detroit game, and then there's Colorado. But I, he he's not he has not had a bad outing at PNC Park. It's it's pretty impressive. I don't know what it is. Maybe he's just got a, a really good bed he likes to sleep on. Uh, in his apartment or 
if he's just comfortable with this ballpark, if the dimensions fit him well. But it, it's been a big difference I've noticed in the splits where Skeens, yeah, I, I mean, the first two at bats were extra base hits and he literally laughed at the home run. The velocity is impressive. The splinker was good. I, I don't think it was the best we've seen. I thought the curveball was pretty underrated today. But you can talk about what he does every single time. This is only the second time in eight games that he's pitched where they've lost. And in those two losses, both of them were very winnable games. Uh, they He gave them seven, in a, seven innings of one run ball today. The other loss, they blew a four-run lead. I mean, I don't know what more you can ask from a starting pitcher than coming in and consistently giving your team a chance, a legit chance to win every time he takes the bump. So we've got two more topics to hit on. We're going to breeze through them real quick. Uh, the first one is the number five spot in the rotation, which is going to come up, I believe, in Cincinnati, right? It'll be it'll be Falter on Monday. It'll be Mitch on Tuesday. And then you have that open spot. Martin Perez pitched Saturday, so I don't think he will have enough turnaround time to be in that spot of the rotation. What do you think, and Andrew, is it just another bullpen game? Do you just see Mol- Moljinski and, and Ortiz again? And moving forward, assuming you get Perez back by the end of the month or by the trade deadline, assuming Marco Gonzalez is back maybe a month from now, what are you looking at with that fifth rotation spot? Yeah, I'll start here with um, – I know Perez told a few of us that the plan after that start was to – He'll join the team in Cincinnati on Monday. So certainly that's something to keep uh, keep an eyes out for is, does he join the team? Because if that's the case, then I would fully imagine that he'll make a start in Atlanta probably on that Friday. Um, but regardless, the way I view this, the way that I interpret this is Martin Perez will join the rotation. He will have those opportunities to pitch. And then depending on how that goes, he either becomes a trade commodity when Marco Gonzalez comes back because you need to market Marco Gonzalez. You need to get him a few starts out there to show that one or two of one of those guys or both of them could be moved. Now I'm not advocating for both of them to be moved, but it's possible. These guys are on expiring contracts. They've both dealt with injuries. You would like to recoup some kind of benefit on either of them. If you can, just given the nature of them being expiring deals, or at the very least you can trade them in, you know, to use a different sport terminology, a hockey trade where you could trade him for a bat. Um, something that mutually benefits both teams versus it being, you have to, throw the ball down the line and get a prospect in return for either of those guys for some, you know, uh, you know, a lottery pick where you're just throwing the, something against the wall and getting some 17 year old kid. I don't think that needs to be the case with either of those guys. So I view it as this is Martin Perez's spot in the rotation, whenever he's healthy for the next month, when Marco comes back, it becomes Gonzalez's and that's either because Perez gets dealt or Perez gets moved to the bullpen. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, it's going to be interesting because both of these guys have told me they're starting pitchers. Uh, I mean, Perez has said, and it's not just unique to me. I'm pretty sure he's told you as well. He was not happy when he was moved to the bullpen last year in Texas. And a big reason why he wanted to be in Pittsburgh was because it gave him a chance to be a starter for the entire year. And I don't know if that chance exists right now. And then Marco Gonzalez in a conversation I had with him today, as we're recording on Sunday, and I sent Andrew the audio. I was like, can you believe this? Uh, but it, he said, you know, uh, it's, he's like, I'm I'm a starting pitcher. And it will be here or it will be somewhere else. But I, I am a starting pitcher. So that's what he's rehabbing with the intention to come back and be. Um, these are two guys that are veterans. They are the elder statesmen of the pitching staff as far as starters are concerned. Um, and like, like you pointed out, Andrew, I mean – I mean, maybe there's a world where they just go with a six man rotation and you hold on to both of them because I think there is value in both hanging on to both of these guys simply because I'm not confident either one of them will remain healthy for the remainder of the year after they return. Um, but it'll be interesting. I mean, is that in the best interest of your team to spread out the usage of Jones and Skeen? Sure, in one area, it keeps their length under control a little bit more, but the guys typically give you a really good chance to win when they're pitching. So you think you'd want them to play a little bit as well. So um, interesting scenario where there is a lot, there are a lot of mouths to feed, uh, contra- you know, contradictory to the bullpen where it's looking pretty thin right now. And it might not be thin for long, but as of right now, area of concern, Andrew, with Bednar going on the I.L.? Uh, if it's a one to 10, I'm going to call it a seven. Um, 
the reason I go that high is just this has happened earlier this year, albeit earlier in the season in spring training, it was a right side issue. Now it's a left side issue. Do I have that correct? I have my direction yeah. correct there. Okay. Um, but with Bednar, yeah, I mean, listen, this is a guy who had injury challenges early in the year. How did he fare when he came back? Struggled mightily because he didn't have spring training really. And, you know, had his issues at the outset. I imagine that might lead to a rehab assignment of some sorts when he comes back, hopefully for the Pirates' sake. It's not terribly long. Regardless, he has been a linchpin at the back of that bullpen the same way that Colin Holderman has been. And Holderman, of course, was tagged for a couple of runs um, during Sunday's game. Araldus Chapman has looked better, but is still inconsistent. And then the middle relief issues are still ongoing, where some guys have turned in solid performances, and at other times they've struggled mightily. There are injuries. Hunter Stratton is still on the injured list. Brian Barucki is still a ways away. The bullpen is in a troublesome spot right now. And I'm curious how Ben Sherrington will approach this over the next five weeks or so, because he had said recently on the radio show of his um, that the idea was to continue taking shots, that it's not going to be at the forefront of trade issues, is going to be getting middle relief pitching via other teams with having to give up assets of their own. Personally, I think that's a problematic strategy. Um, I'm not a fan of the rhetoric. I don't think that's the right way to approach it for the Pirates. I'm curious to see how they go about this because middle relief pitching and now with Bednar being out, the bullpen in general, this is a troublesome spot for the team. And it's it's more troublesome when you consider that this is a team that more often than not wins its games by one run, yep. by two runs, you know? And, and I think that that, and I'm not going to blame that for being the reason behind whole, or uh, Bednar's injury, but I would have to think it, it doesn't help matters when you're consistently putting those back three in high leverage spots night in and night out. And and that's been mentioned by, I believe John Wayner was the one who pointed it out uh, earlier this week on the broadcast where he waits for this team to go on a run and rattle off five, six, seven wins in a row. But it's really hard to do that when you're not scoring runs at a high clip. It's very hard to win six, seven games in a row when you're only winning three to one, four to two, one to nothing, two to one, because you're putting heavy mileage on your marquee arms in the back end of the bullpen. And that's going to lead to fatigue. And with fatigue comes either injuries or poor performance. And we've seen that now in this series from the best two back end arms that they have. One of them is now on the IL, and the other, on Sunday, surrendered the same amount of runs in one outing that he had all season prior to that outing. So I, I think it is a little bit of a product of offense. Again, not entirely to blame, but it's a big concern for me simply because that one, two, three punch of Chapman, Holderman, Bednar is a big reason why this team has played over 500 ball since May 11th. And, you know, Chapman has been better. In June, he's he's got a 235 ERA uh, in eight appearances, over 10 and a third innings of work. This is what you paid for. This is why you invested $10.5 million in him. And he's got to deliver. We've said all year it's going to be a lot of ups and downs. Right now, it looks to be on and up. It's got to stay that way. Because the rest of this thing, I mean, Barucki might be back by the All-Star break, maybe. But can you bank on that? You don't want to have to rely too much on a Kyle Nicholas, do you? Or a Carmen Majinski. It's really thin right now. The starting pitching's doing its part, but it would be a it would be a true shame if they lose even a couple of more winnable bu- games due to bullpen blunders, because that could take them completely out of this thing, Andrew. With how convoluted the National League is, every loss hurts, and when you lose one of your biggest assets. That could lead to more painful losses, and this is not a point in the season where this team can afford to drop any more winnable ball games. No, certainly not. Um, And it doesn't get any easier when we look ahead to the rest of the schedule because you and I are splitting up the road travel this week, but um, you look at the next three opponents, with it being the Reds, the Braves, and the Cardinals, the Cardinals who have been the best team in baseball since Ollie Marmol got thrown out of the game uh, between the Cardinals and the Brewers, 23 and 12, I think, in their last 35 this is going to be a critical stretch. And I think we're going to say that probably a few times on these podcasts, just given the nature of um, leading up to the trade deadline. But I do truly think this six game road trip, three against a divisional opponent, three against a very much playoff bound Braves team. This is going to tell us a lot about the team. That's where my sure. mind goes. Sure is. 
He's Andrew Destin. I'm Noah Hiles. Our show is brought to you by the North Shore Tavern. You can check out all of our work at post-gazette.com. Andrew Destin's got a billion articles up there that will uh, make you shed a tear or two. Uh, a heartwarming writer, this guy is. And me, I just write about Paul Skeens a lot. So you can check out all of our coverage there. You can head to post-gazette.com for that. You can also check out our YouTube channel and podcast network where we'll have Pirates analysis along with every other Pittsburgh sports team in town. Thanks for tuning in. We will see you again in a couple of days. Pirates heading to Cincinnati for three games against the Reds. Take care. Thank you for checking out this content from Post Gazette Sports. If you watch this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. For all of the sports coverage the Post Gazette has to offer, visit post-gazette.com.